Thank you for tuning into our session today on truth, reconciliation, and sport, a conversation with ultimate champion and chief Laura Muscle Savage. My name is Daisy. And my name is Catherine. And we are proud members of Traffic Ultimate, a Vancouver-based competitive women's Frisbee team. Instead of a competitive Ultimate Frisbee season this year, our team committed to learning more about social, political, and racial justice. After a series of informative education sessions led by some of our teammates around topics such as institutional racism, intersectionality, and the history of racism in Canada, we wanted to find a way to build on our learnings and to involve our greater ultimate and sport community as well. Hence the opportunity to have a conversation with Chief Laura Muscle Savage. I'd like to take this time to acknowledge that today we are hosting this session on the traditional and shared territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. We welcome this opportunity for any of you to acknowledge and type in our Zoom chat box the traditional Indigenous lands on which you are joining us from today. The format of today is webinar style, so we have a number of panelists, including our speakers, that will be the main feature on your screen. However, please type any questions you have in the Q&A box during the talk. Uh, we will have some time after Lara and Sanya's interview to do a Q&A. Thank you to everyone who has donated on the event, uh, on the Eventbrite page to Click. Click stands for Contributing to Lives of Inner City Kids. Click raises funds for programs that support inner city kids in Vancouver. These programs include out of school care, uh, food programs, fighting food insecurity, school trips, leadership and summer camps, literacy programs, and a range of sports, recreational, and arts and culture activities. A majority of the participants of Click are Indigenous members, immigrants, and people of color. So far, we've raised over $2,000 for Click and engaged more than 200 people with this talk. Sport Calgary has offered to host today's panel on their Zoom platform. As a result, we were able to have more folks join in on the conversation today. Sport Calgary is a volunteer and nonprofit society that represents over 300 sport organizations in the Calgary area. As an advocate of sport, Sport Calgary strives to assist, support, and influence the growth of sport in the city of Calgary. We would like to thank Sport Calgary for their support in this event. We are really excited to introduce our speakers for today. Lara Muscle Savage is an accomplished ultimate player. She competed in four World Ultimate Championships with Team Canada, winning two gold and two bronze medals, and is an alumna of Vancouver Goo and Prime, um, and a one-year alumna of Vancouver Traffic. Lara is the chief of the Squaw First Nation and also dedicates her time to being the director of sport for the Indigenous Sport, Physical Activity, and Recreation Council, or ISPARC. Sanya Pleshikov will be interviewing Lara today. Sanya is a founding co-captain of Traffic, uh, who currently works with the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. We will now turn it over to Lara and Sanya to give their highly anticipated talk. Hi, greetings everyone. Welcome to this amazing event. Um, it's Lara Muscle Savage here. I'm coming to you from the Squaw First Nation, which is uh, in Stalo territory in the Fraser Valley in BC in the city of Chilliwack. Um, I, I'm just so excited to be here. Thank you uh, to Traffic for this opportunity to uh, engage and to share uh, with all of you uh, today and for this invite. Um, I, I am from the Squaw First Nation on my father's side. My father is Shilawatil, the late Chief Roy Mussel, and um, my mom is Elaine Elliott. And um, I, I have grown up here at the, in the Squaw Reserve in Chilliwack and as well as uh, Vancouver. So I consider, you know, I have had both urban and reserve life um, and have played uh, ultimate since since my high school days and we'll get into a little bit more about that story. So um, the opportunity came with um, connecting through traffic and through Sanya. So Sanya, thanks for this opportunity for for thinking of me when with traffic was doing this doing this amazing work 
looking at racial equity, uh, justice, diversity. So um, Sanya, I'd love to have you share an introduction of yourself too. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. This is just yeah an amazing opportunity. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, and Lars, I'm just so looking forward to learning from you today and, and hearing more about your story. So Laura and I uh, overlapped um, for just one year on traffic uh, when we played on traffic in Team Canada in 2008. And um, Laura, you know, I already, I already heard all about um, your amazing feats. You're already a legend when you came onto the team and um, you always had such a big heart. And that's how I think a lot of people remember your time with us is that you were um, absolutely the heart of the team. And I have a strong memory of being with you, um, meeting with our fellow traffic players and getting ready for worlds and how you talked about the importance of family and the importance of your father um, and your, your community. And that really made a big impact on me. So I wanted to thank you for sharing already and, and for the words that will to come, uh, that, that are gonna come. And I wanted to share a little bit about myself and my background and how I have come to this uh, conversation today. So if you allow me a, a few minutes. <laughs> so my name is Sanya Pleshikov and I live and work in Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Humathquiam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish people. I was born and raised near Humathquiam or Musqueam. And I now know that I grew up uh, close to many important village sites like Sanok, Banyay Park, Ayalmo or Jericho, uh, Tsetsnam and Marpole. My ancestors come from Europe. My father is Vladimir Pleshikov, uh, a refugee from Yugoslavia, and my mother was an immigrant from England. So I am not of these lands, but this is my home. Uh, this is where I was born and raised. This is where I work. And this is where we are raising our children. These lands are not my home. I'm not of these lands, but both of these things can be true. Um, Sorry, th th this is my home. So they're not mutually exclusive. And I think this is a really, um, really nice way to think about my relationship to this place and this land. So I currently work for the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation. I manage um, consultation requests from all levels of government, um, sports organizations, museums, post-secondary uh, institutions who are seeking the nation's input on many different kinds of projects. But I'm here as an individual and I'm speaking from my own perspective and from what I have learned. As a kid growing up in Vancouver, perhaps like many of you, I did not learn a lot about uh, the true history of our past. I learned more about um, the Haida and the Inuit than the people of these lands here in Vancouver. Uh, so indigenous people in the distant past in faraway lands. My mother taught me about social justice and my father taught me the value of history, but those things were never connected to this place. So um, I learned about apartheid in South Africa and slavery in North America and anti-Semitism in Europe, but not of the injustices that happened here. My formal training is as a historian. I study the history of Vancouver um, and it was at university that I became more interested in learning about the history of this place where I grew up and the history of our relationship. So I learned a lot from textbooks um, at university, but I feel like I, my real education began when I started working in the community at Musqueam as a student. Um, learning the language, speaking with elders, working with staff at the at the band office, and re researching the history of our of our past. And I feel like this experience has really shaped who I am today. I I carry a part of um, you know every elder, every community member that has shared a bit of their culture and their history with me. I carry with me, um, and I think about my responsibility to each and every one of those people that I've met along the way. So I've been on this path of learning for a long time, over 25 years, and I am still learning uh, today. It's uh, been a constant process. Um, I appreciate, you know, more recently learning from anti-racist educators about, um, you know, the language of white privilege, white fragility, allyship, um, to understand my relationship to this work. It's not always a comfortable place to be, uh, to examine my own assumptions, my own racism, my own blinders that I have on, but I really believe that when we feel this discomfort, it is a sign of growth. And I want to recognize that, you know, the people here are going to be on a wide spectrum of knowledge and learning, and I appreciate that you're all with us today. I'm really proud of the work that traffic is doing today. Um, I think back in my day, our sport was really good about talking about equity issues like gender, but pretty silent around 
uh, reconciliation, the construct of race and racism. So it's really great to be having this conversation now. And I thought um, we could, I could share a little bit about Lara as an, as an ultimate player. I actually talked to some of your former teammates, Lars, <laughs> and I wanted to share the good words <laughs> they had about you. They told me that Lars had a ridiculous wingspan as a mark and beautiful long throws that made the receivers look good always. She was an incredible athlete all around, not just an ultimate, but in many other sports. She was a cool headed player who could get super pumped and fired up, but in a, in a competitive, non confrontational kind of way. <laughs> Lars was strategic and she coupled that well with her ability as a line caller, which is a huge challenge while maintaining your game. She saw the athletes where they were at on any given day, not focused on how they used to play when they entered the sport or how their reputation dictated how they should play. Lars was always amazingly supportive, a great teammate to have, and a great captain. She was an inspirational coach of the UBC women's team and a brilliant speaker. Lars had an easy and radiant smile that was often accompanied by her infectious la laughter. We are so excited to witness her incredible contributions to the world. And finally, Lars always knew the score. So this, um, this brings me, us to our first question for you, uh, which is we're really interested in learning about your personal journey with Ultimate and what drew you to the sport. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Sanya. Thanks for those uh, wonderful words, too, from past teammates. Um, I can't see who everyone is that's joined us today. So I'm, you know, just want to give a shout out to any of my, my prime or goo teammates um, for, for being here and for supporting today. I'm going to share my screen just so that there's some visuals so you don't um, have to just look at um, the screen here. So just bear with me while I give a share. Hopefully that worked. Let's move things around. Can we see that okay? Okay, great. So um, how I got into Ultimate really, I have to first give a shout out to um, Adam Elvis person. So um, those of you who are old school ulti folks from Vancouver, you all know Elvis, so um, Adam. So he did an outreach program with Mike Koweski through, at the time it was the BC Disc Sports Society, um, which was the provincial organization overseeing disc sports, which had branched out into um, Ultimate and then other disc sports. So they did an outreach program at the high schools in Vancouver and um, our, our school that I went to uh, for, gra for graduating was in Vancouver, was on the UBC campus, University Hill Secondary. And Mike and Adam came to do their outreach program with our school. And we had never seen people who could throw a Frisbee like those guys. Um, super impressed from the beginning, got lots of us um, inspired to play. Um, you know, that included furious alumni, and alumni and, and founding player Kurt Savage, who's my husband. Uh, he was at U Hill, we graduated together. Um, CJ, Vicky Chow, BY Chow was just inducted into the UPA Hall of Fame. So uh, lots of us coming from the University Hill uh, group. Um, Tali Vertinsky, uh, I can think of many more, but anyway, that's how I got started into the game. Um, so one of the things that was, a real attractive part of the game was the spirit of the game. Um, so it's so unique. So I'm sure many of you are ultimate players, but and would know spirit of the game well. Um, but those of you who don't, it's one of the most unique aspects of the sport. Um, so at the core of it, the spirit of the game is about putting fair play and respect and sportsmanship basically ahead of anything else, like even winning, putting it, putting it at the forefront. Um, we settle our own disputes. You call your own fouls. Um, there's, a, there's a protocol to, to settling those disputes. Um, so it really does help advance that social and emotional learning, especially for kids in those settings. Um, for working out disagreements, um, teamwork, the respect and sportsmanship aspect are, are just so great for that social and emotional learning for kids. Um, the Spirit Award, often a tournament will have 
a spirit award awarded to that team that the other opponents feel has exemplified uh, those qualities of the spirit of the game. Um, and that's a, a coveted award. Um, I played in the Vancouver Ultimate League on a team one year where we both won the A division and the Spirit Award, uh, something I carry with great pride to be able to hold both of those titles uh, from the same team in the same, in the same year um, means so much because the spirit of the game is so special to, to Ultimate and something that I think many other sports could, could learn from. So that's one of the, the real special components of it. And I make parallels to, to that with traditional teachings and a holistic approach to sport um, when it comes to um, the Indigenous way of doing things and Indigenous knowledge and teachings. So in the work that I do, we reference the holistic model quite often. So if you think of the, the medicine wheel and the four quadrants and ensuring that there's balance between the physical um, nurturing and, and, and feeding that, that physical health, um, the mental, intellectual, emotional component, the cultural component and the spiritual component. Well, I think all sports have no problem helping feed um, and nurture the, the physical element because just because by sheer nature of the activity that you're doing, uh, you're, you're feeding that intellectual part, you're learning new skills, and you might be making new friends, uh, it feels good, um, social connections, all that feeding the emotional side. Um, cultural part can come in organically, but when it comes to the spiritual side, there is that element in the sport of ultimate Frisbee we have spirit circles really at the end of the game, like you're, you're getting together, locking arms, you're at the world championships and you're completing your game and together arm in arm with your opponents. And you're having that moment of sharing. You're having a sharing circle. It's a spirit circle, it's a sharing circle, whatever you want to call it. And we see that in, in our indigenous cultures, um, sharing circles, spirit circles, um, and it's that connecting to something that's bigger than ourselves, um, connecting to each other. I mean, spirituality can be defined in different ways by different people, but it, it is really, to me, it is about connecting to something bigger than, than ourselves. It's about that sense of peace, that sense of purpose, um, the quality of being concerned with the human spirit or the soul. And the spirit of the game and ultimate helps do that, whether we, we didn't, may not have realized it or not, that other sports don't do. So that's one of the things that drew me um, to the sport of ultimate. I'm so grateful for Mike and, and Adam uh, coming to our school. Um, and, you know, I, I also thank, you know, my husband, Kirk, and, you know, Leslie Calder and other players who inspired me to take my game uh, beyond the recreational level um, to, to play competitively because it just, it opened so many doors. So um, I had the opportunity to, as noted, you know, to go to world championships, um, to play, you know, five years with UBC and, just had such an amazing, amazing journey. And the sport has um, meant so much to me. So it, um, if I was to do a redo, I wouldn't change a single thing about my ultimate Frisbee journey. So I hope that answers the question, like why ultimate? There's so many great things could say. There's a reason why it's called ultimate. You know, it is, has so many elements of, of other sports kind of infused into it, all the best of the best. Plus it has the spirit of the game aspect, which I hope, that is never lost with the game. Um, that's the, the biggest part. Thank you so much, Lars, for sharing. Um, I'd never really thought about those parallels. Um, and it's so interesting to hear you talk about your culture in relation to, in relation to ultimate and, uh, and ultimate culture. So we're, we are interested in hearing a little bit more. Um, can you tell us about uh, growing up in the SQUA First Nation and how it shaped you as a person and as a player? Yeah, so um, as, as I mentioned before, um, I'm from the Squaw First Nation on my, on my father's side and um, grew up on the Chilliwack Reserve in, in Chilliwack. Um, you know, I've, I've grown up with my First Nation family um, and on reserve, so it, it's, it's what I knew. Um, I also have walked a very interesting path in that world because I, I don't appear indigenous. Um, 
and and so it that has made for a very interesting walk in in life not um visibly appearing indigenous but growing up growing up indigenous and growing up with my first nations family so um yeah i i knew when i did my post secondary that at some point i wanted to be able to give back to to my community because i had tremendous support um to complete my post secondary from from my community and you know had my family ties back here so wound up moving back to to the reserve um you know about 11 ish years ago uh, uh, with kirk um, we were raising our family here and living in the community uh, and seeing just still you know the continued challenges that are are typical to first nation communities uh you know with, with poverty um drug and alcohol issues um housing just their you know social issues there's just there's so many to list so it, it meant um a lot to me to put my name forward for for council so that i could um at least try to help um contribute back. So I, I've been on council with my community the last seven years and was encouraged to allow my name to stand for this latest round of nominations for, for chief and happened to get elected just this past fall. So I'm new to the chief role, I'm not new to the councillor role, but new to being the chief councillor for the community. Um, and uh, I, I'm very humbled and honoured and, and proud to be taking on the, the this type of role in the community. Um, I am following in my my family's footsteps and in, in that my grandmother was the first female chief um, of our community elected in 1959. Now that was only a few years after um, women were permitted the right to run for an elected council in their community. Um, and and then, you know, also my my uncle Bill Muscle senior served as chief uh, my father served as chief for 12 years before he passed away so it's a responsibility i'm taking very seriously and it's um it's definitely shaped who i am having uh really really strong uh, leaders in in my parents um and my, and my grandparents um and other family members so i've got a lot to learn and um but uh you know, sport, I think, has played a big role in helping also prepare me for this because playing sport, you know, you just learn the, you know, cooperation, uh, even in an ultimate, you learn some negotiation skills out there right on the field. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been, um, it's, it's a really great opportunity. And I think that um, to, to, to take a step back when this picture that you're probably seeing right now on your screen is um, the Canadian women winning worlds in 2004. We've just finished um, our finals against Finland and coming home and back to Canada. Um, it, this actually opened some new doors for me into indigenous sport. So I graduated UBC with a sport management degree uh, it was a Bachelor of Kinesiology, but it was specializing in sport management. So, you know, I minored in commerce. It was more the sport management side. I'd always wanted to work in sport. So I, you know, was work, worked for a couple of years for the PGA Tour. I worked for a couple of years with the BC Sports Hall of Fame. Now, these is what we would consider the mainstream sports system uh, within Canada, organizations like that. And um, following this world championship win, I was nominated for the Tom Longboat Award, which is, um, Tom Longboat was an Indigenous Olympian, an amazing story, please look him up if you've never heard of Tom Longboat. Um, but there's an award named after him, it's a, it's a national award awarded to the top Indigenous female and Indigenous male athletes for, for Canada. So in 2005, as a result of this, the world championship win, I won the Indigenous Female Athlete of the Year for Canada. And that introduced me to the Indigenous sport system within Canada. I learned that there was uh, an organization called the Aboriginal Sport Circle. I'd never heard of them before up to that point. I wasn't that familiar um, 
with their work and that there were provincial and territorial Aboriginal sport bodies across Canada. So that opened a whole new world for me. So um, I wound up getting a job with um, the, the Vancouver Organizing Committee for the 2010 Winter and Paralympic Games that were coming to Vancouver, specifically to work in uh, Indigenous sport. So um, got to oversee some amazing projects. Um, I, I got invited to Manitoba. Um, here's a picture of me in Manitoba with, uh, with Canadian Nationals were held in Winnipeg that year. And I was invited to come and do a session, an all day session with local indigenous kids. And um, that was captured in a documentary that was featured on APTN uh, the following year. And, started really seeing the difference that role models can make in the lives of Indigenous youth. And so um, really was so proud to be able to start taking my work experience um, with working in sport and growing up in Indigenous community and having that background and tying and marrying those things together in my career. So um, basically since 2005, I've been working in Indigenous sport. So I've now, for the last 10 years, been working with the Indigenous Sport Physical Activity and Recreation Council, or known as ISPARC in BC. Uh, we work with um, various provincial sport organizations, multi-sport organizations, um, local Indigenous communities, all to try, at the end of the day, we're really trying to maximize opportunities for Indigenous participation in sport and increasing that opportunity. So. Um, that, that I, I've gone on a long, long winded answer to your question, Sanya, but um, it's, it just touched me in so many ways, uh, um, the sport and my connection uh, to the work. So um, just to explain a couple other pictures here is again, that, that uh, opportunity to work with the indigenous youth in, in Manitoba. Uh, it's led to some other recognitions. The BC Sports Hall of Fame honored our team prime in the In Her Footsteps um, gallery. So you can see Hillary Dunn, co-captain Hillary and I there with um, you know, recognition for our team prime from on a, on a gender recognition. And then the other photo is uh, some art of artifacts, I guess they're called, right? Um, you know, Frisbees and some of um, my gear that's in the Indigenous Sport Gallery that's featured at the, the BC Sports Hall of Fame. So um, lots of interesting uh, connections there. Thank you so much, um, Laura. Maybe you can speak a little bit more about your work um, with iSpark and, you know, what you're observing is happening in in the field of sports and in in relation to reconciliation and working you know and indigenous communities and kids um, what are some of the takeaways or learnings that you can share with us yeah so we have um so when i say we talking about i spark now organization one of the programs that we oversee is um, the team bc program for both the national aboriginal hockey championships and the North American Indigenous Games, which we call NAG for short, N-A-I-G, NAG. So um, I served as the chef de mission for Team BC um, for those games where we see over 500 Indigenous coaches and athletes from across BC representing the province um, at the North American Indigenous Games where there's teams from all across Canada as well as contingents from the United States. And this event is the North American Indigenous Games is so unique in that it's not just a celebration of sport excellence, it's also a celebration of cultural unity and pride. So while Indigenous cultures from across Turtle Islands, which are like North America, are so diverse and have so many differences, um, at the end of the day, there is this unique um, togetherness that is felt with the, the cultural pride that we all carry with our Indigenous um, backgrounds. So um, our organization does um, support the Team BC program for NAG. Um, and that's one of the pieces of iSparks work that is dearest to my heart is seeing these kids having that opportunity um, to come together to compete and participate in the sport that they love. 
but also to meet and come together with other Indigenous youth athletes and leaders. Um, it's an event like no other. I mean, I've been to world championships for, for ultimate and other provincial level competitions. And um, of course, this, that, that element is great. I don't want to take away any, anything from those events, but there's something so special about that cultural unity and pride that comes with, with these events. So this is what um, is at the core of um, my passion for the work. Um, and so one of the things that we will see in these games um, is recognition of the, that truth and reconciliation component. So in, in this photo right now, actually right before you, you'll see on the right hand side, our Team BC elder Alec Nelson, great pioneer for um, Indigenous sport in BC and within Canada and the NAG movement. Um, he is an inducted member of the BC Sports Hall of Fame. Um, and the, the most prestigious award you can be awarded in BC, which is the WAC Bennett Award. So he's here on the stage when uh, BC was awarded um, we for as the overall game winner of the North American Indigenous Games. And he was citing the 94 calls of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action. And he had the thousands of youth in attendance at the closing ceremonies chanting 94 calls. And so that was an opportunity as well for those youth. Some of them may not have even understood what the 94 calls were prior to participating in these games, but I, I assure you by the end of them, they were all very aware. Um, so this um, work, includes seeing these youth um, also exemplifying the same things that we see in the spirit of the game with ultimate. So we had our, our soccer teams, um, our whole entire team was taught the, the Team BC song. We had uh, a Team BC song contest. Um, William Wasden uh, was the, the winning uh, um, writer of this incredible song that became our, our Team BC um, chant. Uh, and so you can see that the, youth on the left are, are singing our, our Team BC song. And at the end of a game, they would get into that circle with their opposing team um, and then and shared, shared that drum song with them. So similarly to the way we would do that um, with, with Ultimate, we were seeing that, uh, I was witnessing that with, with our team there when normally you might feel like the last thing you want to do is face your opponents after a game. It's quite the opposite. Same as with, with, with ultimate. It's just that amazing spirit circle, a bit of sharing, sharing a song, sharing culture, um, again, feeding that cultural unity and pride. So our, our work at iSpark um, isn't just about Team BC and the North American Indigenous Games, but I wanted to share this as a primary example because it's, it's an opportunity to teach others about the importance of what these games represent. Because so many people are like, why can't Indigenous youth just participate in mainstream sport? Um, and they can, of course, many of these athletes do, but there are many also who don't, who um, their exposure to sport is really what, what we call the indigenous sports stream. So in my community here at, at Squaw First Nation, there's the River Spirit Canoe Club. They canoe regularly through the canoe season from you know, March to September. They're um, training, they're competing in uh, war canoe races every weekend. Uh, they're not participating in marathon canoe or kayaking that might be held by Canoe Kayak BC or, or, or other mainstream um, canoe opportunities. And it's been that way for, for hundreds of years. So uh, some of them dabble in both. They compete both in the Indigenous sports stream and what's considered mainstream sport. Um, and others only walk and experience one world. So the North American Indigenous Games for some is a pathway, it's a stepping stone for some athletes to go on to things like the Canada Summer, the Canada Summer Games or Canada Winter Games or other competitions. Um, and for, for others, that's as far as they'll go. That is like, it is the Olympics for them. It is up at that level. So it just depends on, on that, that individual and, the, and their journey. Um, 
but one of the things I, I, I'm wearing my, what's called my Team BC Unite shirt. So you see on the screen, um, we had for the 2017 North American Indigenous Games, a really neat opportunity um, because the Canada Summer Games were being held just a few days after the conclusion of the North American Indigenous Games. So just as one game was ending, another one was beginning. We we even had some athletes that were participating in both games, um, but it was recognizing together with the BC Games um, Society, who oversees the Team BC program for the Canada Games, that there's a unique opportunity here. We've got young athletes going to the Canada Games, and we have young athletes going to the North American Indigenous Games. Is there a way that we can recognize the achievements of both to celebrate both? So we came up with this concept of Team BC Unite and um, it commissioned an artist to create um, that Team BC Unite logo. That was uh, Jamin Zorowski, Namgis artist from uh, Vancouver Island who created this Team BC Unite logo with um, a, a, an orca whale representing um, the, the Canada uh, Games unit and the raven representing um, the, the NAG, the Team BC unit going to NAG. And we all donned this t-shirt. So as the Team BC youth were at the closing ceremonies, all 550 of us were wearing our Team BC Unite shirt. And just a few days later, all of the Team BC athletes and coaches for the Canada Games went into the opening ceremony wearing their Team BC Unite shirt. So that was just, you know, one way of recognizing a step towards that um, bridging that gap and that awareness. And so all of those kids at the Canada Summer Games were aware of Team BC and that there is a North American Indigenous Games and what it's all about and then vice versa as well. So um, just an interesting um, homage to a small act of um, reconciliation, unification, bridging some gaps. So uh, that's one example I wanted to share of the work that we do. Thank you so much, Lars. Um, we're actually getting quite a few questions in the chat and I just wanted to, to bring up one from um, because it relates to what you've been saying about from Elise. As Lara's younger sister, I have always looked up to her growing up and she has played a strong role model for so many groups and individuals, including youth, young females and women, indigenous peoples and more. Now that we have children of our own and we see the dynamics and challenges of the world ahead of us, my question is two part. What differences do you notice between our, um, your childhood compared to today and what impacts uh, your development as indigenous people? And two, what advice do you have for the youth of today to encourage and motivate them to find their passion and strive and succeed at what they love? <laughs> hey, Lisi, thanks for the questions. Um, so great to hear from you. My sister, Elise, is in Thunder Bay. So I, that's awesome you joining us today. Um, what difference do I see for today with our childhood? Um, I think that there's more opportunity now with the truth and reconciliation movement to start really making a difference and reducing that disparity, um, you know, in our social outcomes, our health outcomes. Um, you know, there's more Indigenous children in care than, than any other child. Um, the, you know, incarceration rates for Indigenous people, are, are, our health outcomes are poorer than the average Canadian. Um, I think that with truth and reconciliation movements, we can slowly begin to start taking steps. It's not going to happen overnight. We all know that reconciliation is a process. Um, but I think that we are further along now than we were back then in terms of the awareness and the education and that's where it begins. So I think that's one of the biggest differences and advice that I would give to youth today is um, education, just the power of knowledge, whether you're indigenous or non. So many of our indigenous um, children are growing up not getting educated about the legacy of the Indian residential schools and its impacts um, and that history. They're learning it just as non-Indigenous children are learning it too. So um, I think I would just encourage them to keep, keep learning and to keep reading and to keep an open mind um, because the, they're our future and they're gonna make the biggest difference. So knowledge is power. Thank you, Lars. Um, you already mentioned um, 
truth and reconciliation, but I wanted to come back to that. Um, so the question is, how do you see the meaning of truth and reconciliation in the context of sport and perhaps ultimate in particular? And maybe you can talk a little bit about the TRC calls to action for around sport. Yeah, happy to. I, um, I know these five calls that are on your screen here very well because um, it is a part of the work that we do at iSpark. It's embedded into our strategic planning. So for those of you who are unaware, the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission um, was formed as part of the Indian, Indian Residential Schools uh, Settlement Agreement and it took five years of, of, of gathering together stories and experiences from Indigenous residential school survivors from across the nation. Um, they did formulate a report. A part of the report included um, a 94 calls to action. Uh, that's available online. I encourage any of you to, to take a look at it. But within those 94 calls, five of them are dedicated to sport and reconciliation. So this, uh, these bullets in front of you are really like a, a bit of like a condensed version. They are in the written form quite a bit longer than these, but essentially number 87 is about educating public about Indigenous athletes and their stories. It's a little bit about actually what's happening today, um, right now. Uh, number 88 relates back to NAG, the North American Indigenous Games and support for the, uh, those games. 89 is about um, policies, 90 is about staple funding, anti-racism -raci awareness and training, and 91 territorial protocols respected um, Indigenous communities engaged in all aspects of planning and participation when it comes to major sports events and games. So in the work that we do, as I said, this is embedded into our strategic plan, but it's about educating, uh, supporting mainstream sport organizations with understanding an Indigenous long-term participant development model for um, athlete development, coach development. Um, some of you may have heard of LTAD, which is long-term athlete development models. So there's been a movement uh, that began um, connected with our executive director, Rick Brandt and, and others across Canada to form an indigenous long-term athlete development model. And as that began to shape over time and getting feedback from um, the indigenous communities across Canada, learned that not everyone sees themselves as an athlete. Um, competition isn't always as important in all Indigenous cultures, especially in Northern uh, Canada. We see that, um, you know, with, with traditional games, Inuit and Denia games, um, that winning medals is not what it's about. It is about lifting up your opponent, for lack of a better word, honestly, for, for your fellow competitor, uh, fellow athlete, it's about lifting them up and helping them do the best that they can. It's not about uh, trying to win the gold. And so um, the word athlete actually got switched to a participant. So it became an Indigenous long-term participant development model because we can participate in sport and physical activity our entire lives. It's not always about seeing yourself as an athlete. And now we're seeing that mainstream sport is now also adopting that word participant and replacing an athlete. So really great, great influence there is just an example. Um, but there's been systemic um, racism within the sports system, um, you know, beginning way back, you know, at the time of colonialism. Um, we still seeing some of that today, but that's the work that we're trying to do is reduce, reduce that. Um, so here is an example of um, Team 88, which was a movement, a campaign uh, sparked by call number 88, which was about the North American Indigenous Games. So there's um, that logo that you're seeing, all of the teams participating in the North American Indigenous Games. There was 20, 20 or 22 different contingents from across North America, um, you know, 5,500 or so Indigenous athletes and coaches all donning the Team 88 logo just in recognition of um, the 94 calls, but in particular call number 88 to support those games. I think I had a couple of other stories or slides. Nope, they're missing, that's fine. So yeah, so this was the, um, the five calls to action I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of. Um, and 
you know, there's lots of opportunity for, um, for you to look these things up and, and read them for sure and other resources. Thank you, Lars. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about, you know, what, what can we do it, uh, in relation to the TRC and these calls to action. Um, so our, our final question um, is how, how can we contribute to advancing truth and reconciliation in our sport, as well as in our personal lives? Yeah, um, it, as I said, the reconciliation movement, the truth and reconciliation movement, um, it, it, it's complex, it's, it's, it's a process. Um, I'm gonna um, look back on our um, uh, chief, uh, Robert Joseph, who created the Reconciliation Canada uh, movement, his son, uh, Bob Joseph, uh, is the leader of the Indigenous Corporate Training Organization. They do some amazing work uh, and have for, for decades, um, doing cultural awareness training for corporations, for businesses, um, for organizations. Um, he's got some great blogs and books. Um, and he, you know, he talks about how it's, it's multifaceted faceted it's it's complex it's um it's a process it's not something that we're going to see um happening overnight but the truth and reconciliation movement really is the responsibility of all canadians it's not something that's left to someone else so i think there's a responsibility for us all to seek out that truth and educate ourselves and not wait for it to come to you um you know you're all here today maybe hoping to take and learn learn some new things and you know, today wasn't going to be about a cultural awareness training um, module. Uh, we could spend a couple of days doing that, but, you know, as simple as learning uh, about the history of the Indian Act. I mean, that was created in 1876. It's a still living and live document today that impacts all, all of us um, in Canada, whether you are a status Indian or not, there's, there's relevancy as a Canadian to, to have an understanding of the history of that. I mean, it, that law um, is what outlawed um, potlatches, the you know, celebration of our culture, of our people's culture was outlawed by that law. Um, so imagine that beginning in 1876 and not being removed from that act until the 1950s. I mean, that has a huge impact on, on, on our, on our community and our people. Um, the Indian res the legacy of the Indian residential schools and its, its impacts um, are felt uh, within our communities uh, uh, daily. Uh, whether you're a survivor or a, an offspring of a survivor, um, there's impacts. So. And the, the ability to vote, you know, we had a new employee um, in our organization who was non-Indigenous and was really excited about the opportunity to, to be able to vote in Canada for the first time and how shocking it was to learn that Indigenous people didn't have the right to vote in a federal election until 1960. So, um, you know, decades after women were provided the vote. Well, not if you were an Indigenous woman. So just being able to learn just some of those those types of things um, are important. So just, you know, like I said, today isn't going to be about uh, cultural awareness training, but when it comes to reconciliation, we can't forget the truth part. Um, the truth is those stories. It's that um, that storytelling, it's the facts, it's, it's learning about what those things are because um, odds are in your education, in your schooling, what you have maybe already learned um, might be very limited. It also would be um, the colonial point of view, the colonialist narrative. Um, as Sonia pointed out at the start of this session, um, you know, she, she had some really great teachings, but not much of it really related to the land on which, you know, she was living and working and playing on. So, maybe taking some time to learn about your, your in, in Indigenous hosts or your Indigenous neighbours or your Indigenous communities um, that you, you work and play in is a small part, but can make such a difference in that truth and reconciliation aspect. And understanding that, you know, what people might construe as benefits or advantages, um, if there's like a, a, a treaty or a land claim or a settlement agreement, is really looking deeper into the history behind how those things came about and what 
what they all mean. But um, I think that the opportunity to move forward begins with that education piece, um, taking the time to learn and also taking the time to have some reflection about you and your space and where you what privilege you may may be holding or carrying without realizing it um, but that's a really good place to start i think territorial land acknowledgements are great so um, at the beginning of the event just we had today was the territorial land acknowledgement everybody sharing in there in the chat where where they're what um ancestral lands they might be coming from today those kinds of things might seem really small but they they absolutely do make a really big difference so those are some of my thoughts i know sunny you might want to add some as well yeah, thank you so much um i totally agree with you it starts with ourselves and um that that should be really the first place of inquiry is to really examine in the place we live, who are the, who, on whose lands are we living? How do we pronounce those names? Um, and to reflect on our, our ancestors and where we come from and how those ancestors related, you know, to the indigenous peoples of these lands in the past. Um, I think that it's also, you know, interesting to relate the history to ourselves as individuals and, and you know, the work that we're doing in the world. Um, some of us, you know, maybe students, some of us may be working or developing our careers. Um, you know, if you're, if you're a teacher, learn, learn about not just residential schools, but the 60s scoop, the child welfare system, the fact that more children are in care today than attended residential schools. Um, you know, if you work in law enforcement, thinking about the RCMP and their role um, in taking children from families. The healthcare system, um, you know, the history of Indian hospitals and the impact that that had on communities. Uh, if you're a student, you know, look into the history of your institution, your college or university uh, to examine, you know, I think of UBC and, and some of the, the racist history and, and sports at UBC. Um, and yeah, so it's, I think it's really important to to bring yourself into the picture and to understand how you and your work and your, your family kind of relate to this uh, this truth. And I something that's been taught to me is to, th is to think about this as the, the history of our shared past um, and to really look at how, how things have intersected. Um, yeah. Yeah, if I could add to that. Um, the picture in front of you right now is um, up, up the top left, that's Terry Felix. So he was the first indigenous pro soccer athlete in North America. Um, he's he's local here in Stalo territory. He's from the Staelis First Nation. And uh, um, so you know, wanted to give a shout out to Terry and his story. Uh, the picture below that um, is an Nanaimo a football team that won the provincial championships back in like 1903. Uh, Harry Manson is situated on the bottom level on the floor. He's second from the right. Uh, he was from the Sinanaimo First Nation. Um, so incredible uh, an athlete. Um, so it's lots of amazing research done uh, on, on Harry and his legacy. Uh, he was recently inducted in the BC Sports Hall of Fame, but his story is unique in that he, he won this provincial championships with the Nanaimo team, even scored some goals and um, but was um, not allowed to attend the, the banquet um, because he was Indigenous. So there's just, you know, that kind of history, those sort of stories um, need to be shared, need to be told. Alec Nelson, our elder who did the chant of 94 calls with the thousands of athletes at the North American Indigenous Games, that's who you see in the color photo before you. He's, he's a soccer player for life, for sure. Um, and he's an Indian residential school survivor. And um, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing with all of you, you know, how he, he has really seen sport um, as his safe place. It was his freedom. Um, I, think, I think my next slide is actually his quote. So this was something I definitely wanted to share before we opened it up to, to some more Q&A. So this is, these are Alex's words here, sport created bonds within the school itself. It was an opportunity to get out there, play and be free and be with your friends and have fun. Soccer was my saving grace, my sanity while in residential school. So we just really wanted to kind of come back to the, the power of sport um, that it has had even with Indian residential school survivors and so for a survivor like Alec, it was sport was his one saving grace 
It was his sense of freedom. I know it is that way, even for those of us today, that when we're playing sport, um, how powerful it can be for creating good medicine for your spirit. It's preventative medicine. It's good medicine for your soul and for your spirit. And we wanna be sharing that with our indigenous kids because uh, it, it really is. A, it, we want those um, sport experiences to be safe and welcoming and inclusive. So if there are ways that you can help do that for indigenous kids, non indigenous or non, but just creating very welcoming um, and inclusive and safe spaces, um, that will make such a difference because sport, sport has the power to do such good things and create good medicine. Thank you, Laura. Um, we are getting some questions about resources uh, and I know that we have a list that we're gonna share uh, with the group. Um, I see the reference to the 21 things you may not know about the Indian Act that's on the list and we, maybe we can come back to that. But we're also getting questions. You were started to answer the, this already, but you know, how can sports, uh, maybe ultimate specifically, sports organizations make space for BIPOC and marginalized communities? Um, and there's also a question of, um, yeah, just making, making space for it for Indigenous athletes to come into the sport. I think it's about like relation, relationship building, starting to um, create relationships. It will take time. Uh, building relationships um, might be, might you might need even more patience um, just because there can be, uh, you know, there might be that, that trust factor if it's, you know, you're making cold calls or making introductions. Um, building that trust may take some time, but that's the first step is really just starting to build those relationships and connections and creating those opportunities. Uh, awareness training is so important. We encourage sport organizations that we work with to look at things like the Aboriginal Coaching Module, which is a course offered by the National Coaching Certification um, NCCP. It's, it's offered as an NCCP course. Um, there's uh, one of the resources that I, should, I hope we'll be able to share with others uh, included um, the Sport, Sport for Life Society. They've got um, a couple of e-modules that they've got on their website, encourage people to take. Uh, so there's lots of, there's lots of um, training opportunities out there and that will make a big difference because again, that's just part of the truth and moving towards truth and reconciliation is that education part. So the awareness training is so key. Um, and, and yeah, and then in building the trust and always remembering that we should be working with Indigenous communities, not for Indigenous communities. So when you're going into that space and in that relationship building, always coming from a, a place, a spirit of collaboration um, and not working for a community, but with a community. Yeah, absolutely. Um to do that learning first, I think, that basic learning before entering these conversations and to walk with humility, I think is a lesson that um, I try to carry with me, absolutely. Yeah. And ask questions too, you know, yeah. ask questions and, and coming from that place of humility when asking them, but you know, about how to pronounce the, the nation's name, um, learning some of the, the language. Um, I hope Jimmy Roney's on here with us today, but Jimmy with uh, BC Ultimate is doing some incredible work with the um, Community Ultimate Spirit Project. And that Ultimate Spirit Project has included um, Jimmy and other coaches who have that training. They've taken the Aboriginal coaching module as well as other, other trainings, um, working with, not for, Indigenous communities, uh, creating discs with their local art on it, um, having a local elder who knows the language translate some of our ultimate lingo, some of those words we're using in ultimate, um, having them translated into, into their language. So um, yeah, and coming from that place of humility and, and grace when doing it. Thank you, Lara. I'm just scrolling through some questions. <laughs> um, not to put you on the spot too much, but can you think of any examples or stories, um, maybe you've touched on this already, of, of being a good ally, of being a, an anti-racist in this sport and in our, in our personal lives? I think I was just giving one of my <laughs> favorite examples, which is of, of Jimmy and his work. Um, it's coming from the best place. It's, um, it is about building bridges and creating relationships and understanding that there can be healing 
there can be healing when learning about each other. So um, great example, Jimmy took our healthy living leader training, which allowed an opportunity to apply for a grant to run a program. He chose to run that program in doing an ultimate spirit project with an Indigenous community, which ended with having a non-Indigenous school and the Indigenous school coming together and having Frisbee together. So using sport as a way to bring together these two groups of kids that may not have otherwise been interacting with each other and just having the the fun and the play um, being a vehicle for for that piece so i think that's a really great example of just being an ally of of using something um, so fun with sport with ultimate um, to bring to bring um, communities together and start just building relationships. Thank you, Lara. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand, but another question we we had was, you know, questions around how to address, you know, when we witness, you know, racist behavior or words when we encounter them. Um, I know it's a really difficult a difficult thing to think about, but could you perhaps share about what approach you might take in those situations or what advice you might have for, you know, people, people like me? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think that we all have a responsibility to, um, to not accept those instances um, when we witness it, when we have, if it's uttered um, or you, you're seeing something or you're hearing something that that we don't accept it. That you, we can we can respond passively and and do nothing, and then maybe contemplate later about wow what that person said or did. We can be aggressive about it and and, and go in in another end, end of the spectrum. It's kind of meeting in that middle, and intervening it, stopping it. Like I think we do have a responsibility to not ignore a statement that is a stereotypical statement, or we've seen, you know, witnessed something that's racist, a comment or something that you've seen. Um, I think we all have a responsibility to, to respond to it, to not be passive about it, but, but to seek out the root of it. Cause I think a lot of it just relates to ignorance. It a lot relates to just a lack of understanding and a lack of awareness. Um, you know, we had, a. Uh, I, I, I know someone who's criticized um, indigenous student who was late and disruptive in a class, but at the end of the day, it was a win. It was a win that that student was there. It was a win that this, that student was making it to school, um, you know, and not maybe understanding from where that person was coming from and their home life and what those circumstances might be. If, and if they did it, what it would might help understand that it was a win that that student was making it to school in the first place. And so, um, yeah, I think that um, for racism, one of the biggest things is to just not be passive about it, to actually take some time to maybe have that conversation um, and get to the root of it and educate and increase mm -hmm. that awareness to have understanding. Yeah, I, I know it's a tricky question and it really depends on on you know the individual i i think for myself you know as a as a white settler and the privilege that i have i i get really fired up and i you know i come at things really hard sometimes and i've just found that it doesn't it's not very effective in ch in changing anyone's mind so um definitely to stand up um to name it um but to approach with curiosity about where that person is coming from mm -hmm. i find is more successful <laughs> Um, that's wonderful. We just have, I think we'll, we'll have time for a couple more questions. Um, I wanted to come back to what you were saying about, uh, your decision to come to, to, to put your name forward or to accept the nomination to take on this, uh, role of chief. Um, and I want, so I want to talk a little bit more about leadership. So I was, we were wondering how the leadership principles you grew up with, grew up with informed your leadership style as an ultimate player and perhaps how ultimate has shaped how you lead today? Mm. Um, yeah, good question. Um, one of the things that ultimate taught me um, was that you can't do it alone. Like lead, lead, leadership is, is not like a, it's not one person. Um, 
I don't know where the junta thing came from, the word junta, but it was this collective leadership uh, model being used in Ultimate, where it was this, this group of leaders um, and combining their strengths as leaders to, to make the best uh, pathway, to create that best pathway uh, for, for their team. So um, I love that model. Um, you know, we're, we had five co-captains going to Worlds in 2004 and we all had our role to play. We all had complementing strengths. You know, sometimes you needed somebody to be a little more hardcore and run your, in your huddles, uh, uh, your circles, right? Um, sometimes you needed someone to be a bit more of a peacemaker. Uh, you know, we all had our our roles logistically too, like line callers or you know, defensive captains or offensive captains, like we all had those sort of roles to play too, but we also had different strengths in, in our leadership styles and we could draw upon those when we needed to. And I think that that um, is serving me well currently with, with the council that I have within our nation. There's seven of us on council and we all bring something of equal value to the table, whether it's uh, strong and rich in the cultural knowledge and leadership and language within our community. Um, others might have more of education when it comes to governance or nation building. Uh, so there's this really incredible off reserve versus on reserve um, experiences and knowledge. So um, I feel like that uh, what Ultimate has with those leadership groups, and I don't know if teams are doing this so much anymore, but having that junta style of, of leadership like we have within our council, um, I think can serve really well because you know, at no time do I, ever, do I ever feel that I'm above anyone else on the council in the chief councillor role. I feel that we all have a very equal um, and valuable role, role to play. And I, I take that from ultimate for sure. What I've learned there that there was none of us that was above anyone else within our co-captaincy. Uh, we, we all had something to offer and it was about um, building and working on and relying on the strengths that we brought. Thank you, Lara. That's so interesting to hear about. Um, I think maybe for our, our last question, um, and I'm, I'm sorry if I haven't gotten to everyone's question. There are quite a few comments in the chat, Lara, for you to look at later, and perhaps okay. we can, <laughs> perhaps we can um, capture some of those those questions that are specifically for you, um, and you can address them afterwards. But we've talked a lot about education, and I'm I, I'm sure a lot of people are are being inspired with this talk, and and you know are looking for the next step. Uh, we will send out some resources, but were there? Did you want to speak to any of the resources that you were thinking of? Um, yes, I'd be happy to. Um, there is uh, an organization called Kairos Canada, and they have um, what's called a blanket exercise, um, which brings together Indigenous and non, um, and it's it's a real interactive um, exercise that's done in person. They utilize blankets to help demonstrate um, basically representing Canada uh, and telling the story, walking, walking you through that, that journey to learn some of the, um, of the situations that we've had in our history that, um, that need to be shared and known and doing it in such a um, really powerful and profound and impactful way. So um, our organization, iSpark, as well as our partner Sport for Life Society, we're using the blanket exercise in the work that we do in a sport context. So given COVID situation right now, the unfortunate um, isolation that we're all experiencing, I mean, um, the Kairos um, organization is actually now offering some webinars online. They're actually uh, like kind of virtual sharing circles. So, you know, they've got one coming up, um, you know, next week, I believe that's all about, um, you know, awareness training. Um, I think it's about the legacy of Indian residential schools. They've got a series of them with different topics. So just encouraging people to check out Kairos um, Canada and their, their virtual sharing circles that are coming up. Um, that's something I encourage everybody to check out again. You know, I've mentioned before, I think every Canadian as part of their um, education should read the Indian Act um, and where it stands today. Cause like I said, there's lots of things that have been removed from it, but there's still, you know, it's, it's still, um, you know, a very racist piece of legis legislation and 
Um, I think it's important for Canadians to educate themselves about that. I mean, there's so many, I have so many things I could offer. And I know prior to this as a part of our preparation, uh, there's a list, there's a whole list of some recommended resources. So I hope we'll be able to send that out, whether it's in an email or something to all of the participants. But um, yeah, please check out Kairos Canada and their virtual sharing circles that are coming up. Absolutely, thank you, Laura. Um, again, we are getting some comments from I think former teammates of yours <laughs> and family. And so I, I, maybe I'll just end with this one from Joanne McEwen, just a comment from Laura's cousin uh, from Comox BC. Thank you for your teaching. I learned a lot how sports can transform the individual being and strength to move forward in the future. Awesome, bye Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so Laura, I'll give you the floor if you have any um, final comments uh, and then we're gonna pass it back to uh, to Chewy and um, Daisy. Well, I'll stop sharing my screen here. Um, you know, just want to end with final comments of just gratitude, just expressing my gratitude for first to, to traffic for taking on this incredible body of work. Um, and I'm not referring to today, I mean like this body of work that you're doing um, in Liu of being able to compete. So I think that it is highly commendable and such a great example to, to other teams and things that, um, that you can do when you come together as a team. And, and it's not just about sport. It's more than sport. And I really admire that they've taken this on. So thank you first to Traffic. Uh, thank you to Sanya for thinking of me um, when it came to this type of topic. Um, I, I'm so happy to have been a part of today. And I wanna thank all of the participants who came online today um, to listen and to learn. And I just, yeah, hold my hands up to everyone who has been a part of today. And I hope that you walk away from today, um, feeling like you're empowered to, to continue educating yourself and learning more about Indigenous peoples and Indigenous history um, in Canada and thinking about what place you have in, in the world and in your um, role in sport to help make a difference in the lives of our young people. Oh, and I want to give a shout out to Click, the charity that uh, is being supported today. Um, I. I um, had a, a friend, Mitra Chan, who, um, who connected with me. She's connected to our Team BC programs for the North American Indigenous Games, who, um, who knows the CLIC organization well. And she was really grateful that this charity was chosen. And I couldn't agree with her more. I think it's, uh, it's great, the work that CLIC does. So um, if you haven't already donated, please, uh, please consider. Thanks. Thank you.